What images come to mind when you think of a leader? Maybe someone with a larger-than-life personality. Maybe someone with a corner office overlooking the city. Chances are there is one person that doesn't come to your mind. You. Yes, you. You might not realize it, but you are already leading in ways you don't even know. Every one of us has the power to lead. The question is, what kind of leader are you? Jesus showed us how to lead, and He has given you someone to lead. You were born to lead. Yes, you. Report cards. Report cards show you how you're doing, where you're excelling, and where you need to improve. And for some of us, where we've been failing. Can you remember uh, the last time when you were a kid? Maybe not the last time, but the time you were a kid and you sat down at the kitchen table or somewhere in the living room and mom and dad uttered those dreadful words. We received your report card in the mail today. Do you remember that feeling that just, was it just me? But like something inside of me just died. Oh, that's right. It was my self-esteem and confidence. That's just what died. And I just went, oh man, like, you know, I knew it wasn't all bad, but I also knew it wasn't all good either. I just kind of had that like, ah. And I always thought like as a parent, that would go away because you're on the other side of the table, right? And so um, what, what, I, what I'm holding and what I remember talking with my wife about was um, I still had that feeling because it's like, well, this is my son and I'm his parent and I'm hoping that, you know, we do some good stuff together and he's learning and all those things. So this is a reflection of my parenting, right? No, but yes, but no, but I don't. Mm. So I've got all these emotions going on inside. And so even sitting on the other side of the table, I got hit with all those feelings again. So we open up the report card. We start reading. We're going through just scanning, right? Like, okay, all right, all right, good here, good here. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's no surprise. Okay, get it. And and, and we start going through all the academic stuff, and we're like, okay, he likes math. Like, he's doing really well in in science. Favorite subject, of course, P.E. I mean, right? Like, what eight-year-old is like, I hate P.E. Like, he just, he loves P.E. Sorry to all the eight-year-olds that do hate P.E. Sorry. There's four of you. I'm kidding. It's a joke. But I'm going through the list and I'm like, yeah, like, of course, that's him. And then uh, academically, as you go through everything, you're like, okay, like we're doing good here. And then, you know, we need to improve a little bit here in this area. But like overall, pretty good student. And I'm starting to feel really good. Like, yeah, that's my boy. Like, you know, learned it from his father, of course. And then we get to the part that's about your uh, social development. Like, are you playing well with people? Um, If we're all in the sandbox, like, are you sharing your toys with other kids in the sandbox? Um, Are we calling each other names? What happens, you know, on the playground and that whole thing? So what happens in class, the playground, cafeteria, everything in between? And so I start going through this stuff and I'm like, oh, I get to this sentence and it says, a pleasure to have in class. Like, of course he is. That's my boy. And then the next line says, talks too much in class. Of course he is, is. it's my boy. So I I, I get there and I read it and I'm like, oh man, like how, how could this be? And I start piecing together conversations about, you know, just school and and his friends and, and what I hear him talking about with his buddies on uh, you know, on the soccer field and, you know, like you just start piecing things together at like people's birthday parties and you're like, oh, uh, oh, oh, okay. I see what happens. And on the one hand, like a pleasure to have in class because uh, that's my boy, but on the other hand, talks too much in class. And so I, I, I asked him, I said, let's talk through this thing. Like, what, what's it look like? And he's like, well, my jokes are just better than the teachers. So like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you learned that one from your mom. Like, that, Okay. But you got your humor from your dad. Okay, your wit from mom, humor from dad. Okay, God. But like, we're just, we're going through the list and we're having the conversation and and like, man, a pleasure to have in class, but talks too much. I'm like, oh, he's learning a little bit of discernment because at our household, we talk a lot. We don't have anything to say. We just talk. 
That's just what we do. My wife is quick, just quick wit, quick tongue, and I have to work really hard to keep up. And so we're just firing things back and forth. And uh, we have the love language and the spiritual gift of sarcasm, <laughs> which you know is a double-edged sword. And uh, I'd like to think we're pretty advanced when it comes to that skill. And my son is still learning that skill. You have to discern when it's appropriate and when it is not appropriate. And, um, you know, second grade, eh, you got a bit of a learning curve is all I'm trying to say. But, but we had this conversation and I'm going through everything and I'm like, man, I'm a little concerned, a pleasure to have in class, of course, because he's my boy, but like talks too much is a little bit disruptive, um, doesn't have great timing and is distracting to some of the other kids. And I'm like, where, where did he get that one from? pleasure to have in class is from his father because you know I think I'm great just ask me I'll tell you how great I think I am you do the same thing too don't even but I'm, I'm asking Darcy I'm like Darcy babe like what's going on and she just looks at me I'm like you know he, he's in a Christian school like these are like sweet little angels right where did he and if she had glasses she would have done one of these but you ever have a moment where like the light bulb, just, you just have that moment you're like, oh, like suddenly everything in life makes sense. The stars are perfectly aligned. You know the solution to every math problem and you just, everything, you just tremendous clarity. And you're like, oh, he gets it from me. He got the good and the bad from me. And I just had this moment of like, oh no. And also like, you're welcome, dude. But no, I'm just kidding. But like mixed, just mixed feelings. Like, oh man, what do, what do we do with this? And, 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 and we're talking about leadership. And here's why I bring this whole thing up. Because when it comes to leadership, there's an inevitable principle that we all bump into over and over and over again. And it's simply the reality that as leaders, we reproduce who and what we are and the people that we have influence over. You and I, we all have influence, right? Last week we discovered we are all leaders. Yes, you, even though you're not the CEO of your huge corporation, your mom, your dad, a neighbor, a coach, whatever you are, you are a leader because you have influence. And the problem and the strength is the reality that we will reproduce who and what we are in the people that we have influence with. And on the one hand, that's really good. And on the other hand, ah, it's really, really scary. So what, what I mean by this, it, it, here's what I mean. If you're someone that is, you, whenever difficulty arises, you can see um, just a solution, the possibility, the goodness in really, really difficult situations. You just, you exude hope. You're going to instill that. You're going to reproduce that into other people. That's, that's part of who you are. And that's a really, really good thing because you want to be able to help people, right? If you've got tremendous drive, and like I said, if there's a problem and you're just driven, you will find the solution. Like what a beautiful gift, right? You're going to instill that into the people that you have influence with. You could be creative. Maybe you're visionary, just perseverance. Whatever your gift is, that good thing you're going to instill in them. It's just the reality of life. It's just true. Also, whatever your weakness is, be very careful because you'll probably reproduce that in them as well. And I'm not just talking about moms and dads and kids. This works in any environment that you find yourself in. Especially if you are a leader in an office or an organization. You will set the tone. You will set the atmosphere in that environment. And people will pick up on those things. Because like it or not, for better or for worse, leaders reproduce who and what they are. Meaning if you get angry at the drop of a hat, don't be surprised if you have coworkers or friends that do the same. Jealousy, insecurities, resentment, how about pride and arrogance? These are all things. If we are not very careful and intentional, we will instill these into the people that we have influence with. Because leaders, whether we like it or not, reproduce who and what we are. And it's scary, but it's also a little bit hopeful because I, as I look out, I think for the most part, like, you know, like we're, we got a lot of good qualities here, but we also have a handful of weaknesses. Would you agree? Just raise your hand if you'd agree. Okay. Nudge the person next to you, lead them and say, why didn't you raise your hand? Just 
help lead them to that uh, discovery mentally of who they are. Can I give you a couple examples? I just, I wrote these down. I wanted to read them. Because here, here's how this plays out. This, this is a big deal. Because, because again, our, our, weaknesses, um, our weaknesses are no laughing matter. We go, ah, you know, I'm just angry or I, I'm just constantly late. I just, you know, punctuality, ah, it's not that big of a deal. But the people we work with and do life with, it's frustrating to them. They're not laughing at our weaknesses. They're having conversations with their friends and going, man, I wish they would just figure this out. Because to the extreme, if we just play this thing out, if we don't address these things, they will end up torpedoing the life that we are trying to build in the first place. That's why they're no laughing matter. It is a big, big deal. Here's a couple examples. You have to be liked by others so it keeps you from making the hard calls in leadership. You have a hard time giving constructive feedback or honest and direct communication because you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. You're, you're nice. And on the one hand, being nice is a very great trait. We could probably all be a little bit nicer. However, left unchecked, we become a people pleaser and we don't make anyone better because we don't have difficult conversations. Here's another one. You have poor self-esteem. So no one will ever be able to tell you the truth about you, let alone share with you some of your blind spots. How are we supposed to get better if no one can speak to us honestly? Do you, you ever talk with those people? I know they're not in the room. None of us are this way. But you ever talk to those people? You're like, hey, like, you know, you have the small talk and then it dies down and everyone's thinking, okay, here comes the conversation. That conversation. We go, I, I need to let you know something about you. Uh, when, when you walk into a room, this happens. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but and again, I'm, I'm talking about work and, you know, organizations and, and, and office stuff. But again, play this out in your family, play this out in your, in your school, play this out in, you know, on the football field, just wherever you're involved in and there's people, this stuff is at play. Sports is probably the best example. How, how are you going to get better if every time the coach tries to tell you, you know, an area that you need to improve, you just spin it right back and say, well, you, you didn't say it right. What? It's the coach's job to just tell you, hey, man, when you drop the ball, like, that's a bad thing. You're supposed to catch that thing. Well, if you would just, you know, maybe you could be a little bit nicer in how you would tell me to catch the ball. <laughs> hey, I know you applied and tried out and worked really hard to be on the team to do the things that you said you were going to do. Would you please do the things you said you were going to do, like catch the ball? <clears throat> How, like, how does that conversation go? Do you know what I mean? Now, look, I'm picking on football, but uh, come on, married people. <laughs> come on. It's not what you said. It's how you it. said it. Maybe, maybe you're too sensitive. Well, I didn't like hearing that, so you didn't say it the right way. So now we're not even talking about the actual conversation. We're talking about the thing over here. I'm just saying, these are weaknesses. And if these things go unchecked and they prolong, guess what happens to the quality of your marriage? Come on, somebody. It goes down, doesn't it? Your class, sports teams, marriage, mom and dad to sons and daughters, like all of this stuff, this plays out in the business, your nonprofit, church family, in your small group. Hello. Hello. All, all of this stuff plays out. And if we don't actually do these things, they will, again, they will torpedo the life that you and I are trying to build for ourselves. Now, here's what I think is fascinating because if that isn't bad enough, it gets even worse because leaders want to go and reproduce who and what they are in people. It's just, it's, it's just what we do because birds of a feather, they flock together as it relates to my son and me and our report cards, like father, like son. The apple does not fall far from the tree. This is just human nature. And, and if we're just humans, that's fine. For just normal people, that's fine. That's not that big of a deal. But for those of us that are Christians, followers of Jesus, this is actually um, catastrophic because what we're doing is reproducing ourselves in people and we're supposed to reproduce Jesus Amen. into people. Yes. This is actually a big deal. We reproduce Christ, not ourselves. 
And what can happen, again, if we're not intentional with this, is we will produce someone who knows a lot about Jesus, but also of equal importance, votes the way we want them to, married the person we want them to, went to the school we wanted them to. See where I'm going? All of that becomes secondary to who is Jesus? And do I have a deep relationship with him? This is crucial. This is crucial because as followers of Jesus, as Christians, do you know what Christian literally means? Little Christ. That's the name that they were given. Followers of Jesus in the very beginning in the first century were called Christians. They were little Christ because they all wanted to be like Christ. Christ was their teacher, they were their rabbi, and they wanted to be like their rabbi to do and think and say the things that the rabbi did and said and thought. So they go around, they're like, ah, there's a little Christ, there's a little Christ, there's another little Christ everywhere. We should be seeing a bunch of little Christs everywhere when we come to church. And our weaknesses are no laughing matter because if unchecked and not dealt with, we will reproduce little us's instead of little Jesus's. So how in the world do we actually do this whole thing? Well, you got to go back to the words of Jesus. Matthew 28, verse 18. This is Jesus saying, he's talking. He says, then Jesus came to them and said, what are those two words? Help me out. How much? All All authority. authority. Where? In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, if you have all authority in heaven and earth and you're about to say something to people, what do you think those people should do? Listen and do what he says, right? So here's what he says. He says, because I have all, all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples. Disciples are students or apprentices of Jesus. A disciple is not like a super Christian. Disciple is to be, to be a student, to study under Jesus, to, live, to learn to live your life like he would live your life if he had your job and your home and your career, and your network, and your family. This is what it means to, make it, to be a disciple. And Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So just literally immerse them in the Trinity, right? And, and here's this last part, verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything. Everything. Which, if you read, jump back at 19, if you read that, he said, go and make disciples. So the original disciples here are teaching each and every one of us who call ourselves a follower of Jesus to go and make disciples. So it's disciples making disciples who make disciples that make more disciples. Do you see how this thing's going? It just keeps going and going and going and going and going. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And then here's the encouraging part, because it's a bit overwhelming. He says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He says, I know this is really hard, but you're not going to do it alone. I'll be with you. You'll be fine. Our job as Christians is to not reproduce ourselves, but to reproduce Jesus in the lives of the people that we have influence with. Can I get an amen? Amen. This is priority number one. So how in the world do we do this? Number one in your notes, guard your heart. Now I grew up in church and this was like a youth group thing. And basically what I learned, what I walked away with was like, guard your heart. Don't give it to the wrong person. because You'll be miserable the rest of your life. So guard your heart. Like I know she's pretty, but she has no personality, Steve. Like just guard your heart. Too honest? Sorry. I thought we were in church. I'm kidding. Guard your heart. It, it's not, I mean, it's good advice for dating, but it's not just that. It's so much more than that. Because listen, listen, above all else, this is Proverbs 4, verse 23, above all else, meaning everything that you and I think about in life, all the stuff you're going to do today, all the things you're going to do today to prep for Monday so that you can do the rest of the week, above all of that garbage, guard your heart. Four, here's my favorite word. Everything. Everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. You got to remember in Hebrew, your heart is essentially your, your thoughts and your emotions, how you view and interpret and engage with life. 
the Bible say, you better guard that thing because it will deceive you. It will lie to you. It will convince you to do the things that are not the Jesus things. They're the human Steve things. And again, they say how to go do it, right? And he says, keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Verse 25, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Verse 26, give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Did you catch the four things? Here's how you actually guard your heart. You don't just go, okay, I'm guarding, I'm guarding, I'm guarding. No, no, no. There's very practical ways to do this. The first one is speech. Don't let corrupt talk or perverse speech exit your lips. Stop it. Here's how you know you're a leader is if you have influence over something. If you're all in a group of people and everyone's talking about what restaurant they should go to and they list out three and then you say, I think we should go to that one. And the whole group goes, yeah, you're a leader. Now apply that to speech and how we talk about one another. Oh, I like that person. They're great. They're really, hey, did you know that they actually deceived me? Yeah, they're a jerk. What did you just do to that entire group? You just influenced and led them to that conclusion. Your eyes, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. In other words, don't get distracted. You want to guard your heart? I got great advice. Ready? Shut off your phone. Thank you, I got one. <laughs> do, you know, do you know how many hours? You need to do a little experiment and just figure out how many hours you spend on social media a week. I'm not against it. I'm just saying, I think you'd be surprised at the amount, I know I was, at the amount of hours clocked on social media. It's a distraction. I, I got sons I gotta raise. I have, to, I have a wife I got to love. I got a job that I have to go and work hard at. I've got a community that I'm trying to rub shoulders with and point closer and closer to Jesus. Like, I got stuff to do. I can't afford to be distracted. I have to guard my heart because my heart will go, ooh, that's shiny. You need to go spend your hard-earned money on that thing. I know you bought last year's model, but that's a new one. Ah, do you see what they did to their house? Do you see the colors they put on their walls? Whew. Go buy some paint. I know you're trying to get out of debt and save for a vacation so you can make memories and do things with your family, but their coat of paint is fresher than yours, so chop, chop. Focus on, on Jesus. What, what are we doing with our lives? I would argue we're distracted more often than we think we are. And your thoughts, be thoughts. Be thoughts, your thoughts. Be wise in where you're going in life. Know the direction you're going, know the speed that you're going with. And number four, your steps, right? He says, he says to be thoughtful of the paths for your feet. Don't turn from the right or the left, but keep your foot from evil. We need to be aware of the environments we're walking into. And there are probably a couple that we need to walk out of. This is how we guard our hearts because our hearts will say, hey, Steve, your inclinations, your proclivities, your uh, desires, your preferences, those are not as important as Christ-likeness. And what you're doing with your children or the people you lead, it sure looks like Christ-likeness and your preferences are on the same level. And my heart goes, that's right, because they're correct. No, they're not. That's just my preference. We have to guard our heart because our heart will go, hey, keep on keeping on. Feels good, do it. That's not always of the Lord. Number two, number two in your notes, have a deep relationship with Jesus. The key word there is deep. Don't just know about Jesus, know Jesus. John 10 verse 27 says this, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Quick question for all of us. Can you distinguish the voice of Jesus from the voice of the world, of the demons, of Satan, from any other voice? Like more often than not, we should be able to know if last night's dream was from God or if it was the spicy burrito. Like we should know. <laughs> that shouldn't be a 50-50 thing, right? 80-20 is kind of what I'm hoping here. If the Holy Spirit nudged you, would you know that it was the Holy Spirit? How, do we have a deep 
relationship with God? Do we understand the fact that he unconditionally loves us when we're here on church raising our hands and worshiping him and when we're sinning? His, his level of love for us does not dip or waver. It is unconditional. Do, do we know that in our being or do we just know it up here? A deep relationship with Jesus. One of the ways you can tell if you have a deeper relationship with Jesus is if you love people that you used to, if you love, I'm trying to think of a kind of way to say, uh, if, if you love people that used to bother you, you know, those people, they do that thing, drives you nuts. Do you find yourself being less annoyed with them over time? Because your, your relationship with Jesus is, is growing. It's getting deeper because you're starting to see them the way that Jesus sees them. And I always want to remind us, we're also starting to see ourselves the way Jesus sees us too. Do I have a deep relationship with Jesus? How do I make sure I'm not reproducing my own thoughts and agendas into the people that I have influence with? How do I know that I'm not doing that and I'm actually being more and more like Christ in reintroducing that? I'm learning how to guard my heart. Number two, I have a deep relationship with Jesus. Number three, here's what we have to do. We have to have a plan for shoring up our weaknesses so they don't sabotage our life. Talked about this a little bit in the beginning, but this is a big deal. Our weaknesses are no laughing matter. I want to read a list of weaknesses. See if you can find yourself in here. It got real quiet last service. We'll see how, how it goes this service. A list of weaknesses. Again, probably no one here, probably only everyone online, so love you. List of weaknesses. Time management. That's why you're at the 11 o'clock service. I get it. <laughs> Procrastination. These two are, are cousins, if not brother and sister, right? Uh, too sensitive to criticism. No one can ever tell you the truth because you, uh, you just crumble. Prideful. Keep going. Can't admit you're wrong. Fear of failure. So you have to have all your ducks in a row. Everything is lined up. This idea of stepping out in faith. Well, we can't do that. So those conversations we have with Jesus. If you show me what the end looks like, I'll take the next step. That's a weakness. Lack of motivation or apathy. Well, it is what it is. They are who they are. It's the economy. It's... Fill in the blank, so I just settle and I become apathetic until something else moves. Indecisive, you can't make a decision to save your soul. Jealousy and envy. Remember I talked about my, my son playing on the playground. Isn't it funny that like the things that we learn and experience as like little kids, we bring right into adulthood with us? Jealousy and envy, that sucker is alive and well. Perfectionist. People who don't learn from their mistakes, people who are, who are insecure or low self-esteem. Here's one that people are often proud of, speaking your mind too often. I just tell the truth. I just I say it like it is. Yeah, maybe. You don't have to comment on everything. Coming from a guy who has an opinion on everything and talks for a living. Just because you have a seat at the table doesn't mean you always have to speak at the table. We can... We can learn and be disciplined to not have the last word. Someone else can do that. Overthinking. We'll keep going. There's more. Did you see yourself in any of those? If not, we got a couple more. Can't say no to people. We got a weakness with lust. Like, sure, this could be sexual, but also just this lust, this desire for more, just this insatiable appetite. Gossip, ain't nobody going to trust you because uh, that news becomes everybody's news. Overwhelmed or stressed, or how about this one right here? Just dishonest. Did you see yourself in that list? Here's what's fascinating about our weaknesses is that pr life will just apply pressure and will squeeze in on our weaknesses and that gives birth to stress. And when you and I are stressed and anxious and, and just like, ah, we just, feel, we just feel the squeeze. You know what we're tempted to do? We're tempted to cope, to soothe ourselves. And, and the temptation uh, almost always is negative or sinful. <laughs> Almost always. At least that's my first thought. 
So our weaknesses are not a sin issue, but acting on the temptation, uh uh-oh, here's where we shipwreck our lives. It's right here. We give into this whole thing. We do it right here. Here's a couple ways. Again, see if you identify risky behavior. You have to just, you know, escape reality of life and go um, jump out of 45 airplanes and wrestle a lion and alligator and do all that thing. You just need the adrenaline rush. Alcohol and drugs because you just need to numb. Uh, lust or sex because you need to experience pleasure. You got gluttony, anger, revenge. You just withdraw, you cheat, you steal, you lie, violence, screaming, yelling, and you just hit things. The, the temptation is to cope. And so I'm going to do whatever I have to do to release the pressure. And those things that I just listed, those are the things that torpedo the life that we are trying to build for ourselves and for the people we love most. And if we are not careful, we will reproduce that in the people we have influence with. And it just becomes this massive cycle. You ever wonder why your son is so angry all the time? Might have something to do with mom or dad. Where do they learn to behave that way? I have an idea. Do you see what I'm saying? Like our weaknesses are no laughing matter. We have to check our heart because our heart will say, well, it's just the way I am. My dad was this way, so I'm this way. Yeah, we're just Osbournes. I don't know, man. Am I reproducing that in the people I have influence with or or am I trying to reproduce Christ-like qualities and characters in the people I have influence with? We have to wrestle with these things. And and again, we don't have to give into the temptation. We don't have to do this. Listen to this. It's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except for what is common to mankind. What's common to mankind? Turning your back on God and doing what you want because it feels good in the moment. Anyone ever been there? No one wants to raise their hands. (laughs) You're all at church. You've been there. Listen to this. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can help me endure it. More often than not, he doesn't snap his fingers and boom, the problem disappears. More often than not, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit with supernatural strength to endure. Perhaps a better word would be overcome the temptation. You don't have to give in to that thing. And number four, lastly, have a plan for Christ-like character transformation. If dealing with your weaknesses is all defense, this is offense. How are you going to get better? How are you going to score goals? How are you going to win? How are you going to become more and more like Christ? Because when people look at me and the people I have influence with in our little community, our little network, they should see a bunch of little Christs who look more and more like big Christ every single day. If they see a bunch of disciples of Steve, I have screwed up royally. They need to see disciples of Jesus. So here's how we do this very quickly, very quickly. I love weekly challenges. I'm sorry if you don't, but I do. I love weekly challenges. So I want to invite all of us to take a weekly challenge. And in fact, to make sure I don't go for 45 minutes on this, let's bring the band up because we're going to do, we're going to end with communion and we're going to sing a song. But hear me out as they're coming up. Don't totally disengage, okay? Hear me out. Here's your weekly challenge. Sunday's the Lord's Day. Rest. You're going to need it. Monday morning. Are you ready? Monday morning. Here's what we are all going to do. Monday morning, it's our attitude. We're going to bring a positive, Christ-like attitude to wherever we find ourselves Monday morning. If it's at home raising the kids, that guess what Monday's going to feel? It's going to feel positive, full of hope. Perhaps absence of worry because we want to have a Christ-like mindset and attitude. Do you think God's worried about anything? Why are we? We should learn to adopt that. If we are, in fact, students and apprentices. That's Monday. Monday's attitude. Tuesday's generosity. We're going to purchase someone, something for someone. I don't care what it is. Buy him a pet rock. <laughs> Buy him candy, coffee. Buy him a car. I don't care what it is. We're all going to be generous. By the way, if you can buy someone a car, I'd really like to talk to you after the service. <laughs> you got it. Okay, Wednesday, Wednesday, listen to this. We're going to serve somebody. For those of us that are married, I would suggest serve your spouse. But, but not like, hey, I did a nice thing, but um, where when you're done, they know without a shadow of a doubt that they have been loved and served by you. 
Thursday, we're gonna do forgiveness. I'd suggest we all write a letter and either ask for forgiveness or give the gift of forgiveness to somebody. I do not care if you send it or not. But, but that thing, we're gonna all practice this, ready? That's forgiveness. We don't have to hold that. And Friday, Friday, we're gonna practice self-control. We're gonna eliminate the one thing that brings us joy and we're gonna find it elsewhere. I'd suggest in Jesus. On Friday, I'm gonna try. I drink a lot of coffee. I love coffee. I'm gonna not drink coffee on Friday. Here's what I found out about caffeine and coffee is that I drink it uh, and it feels really, really good. And if I don't drink it, I end up getting a headache. Who, who's in control, the caffeine or me? The caffeine. caffeine is. So, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and be Christ-like. I'm gonna try and be in control of, of self. And anytime I get that, that draw of like, I need a cup of coffee, I need a cup of coffee, I, I'm, I'm gonna go to Jesus. And I'm gonna find my joy there. Now hear me out for just one second. Hear me out for just one second. This is a plan for Christ likeness. Don't get stuck up on, is this the right plan or not? This is a plan for becoming more and more like Christ. And I just wanna ask, does anyone wanna do it? Because if you don't, you're in danger of just reproducing yourself into somebody else. And that, I'm sorry, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's not the goal. The goal is to produce these things is a a positive, hopeful, loving attitude, generosity, service, forgiveness, and self-control. These are Christ-like characters. That's gonna change somebody's life. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna do it all together. And could could you imagine, we have anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 adults on a weekend or on a Sunday. Do you think Lyndon would notice, let's just pick the smaller number, if a thousand adults on Monday morning stepped in and brought a positive, hopeful, loving attitude to the workplace, to the home? Do you think Lyndon would notice? Do you, I, I dare say, I think Whatcom County would notice. I'm just saying. We start forgiving people. We start serving people. We, we start being generous with people. This is how you change communities. This is how you change family trees. This is how you change your soul. So Father, would you help us? Because I need a lot of help. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. God, would you give me a vision of what it really looks like to live my life like your son Jesus would if he was living my life. And Father, help me to be more and more like that. If you agree, would you say amen?